Well, thank you again for joining us this morning for African Creative Industries and in HBCUs. I want to acknowledge our friend and colleague. He is a champion for the AUC Woodruff Library, Dr. Aaron Carter Amy. Um, he approached us. He knew that several people were going to be in town for the Hoodies Award, and he said, we really need to do this. So uh, Dr. Aaron, way you the folks. Thank you. Thank you. We're pleased to uh, host this session here at the Atlanta University Center for the Library. So I know we're a little bit delayed in our start, but we do have some delicious food that we'll enjoy afterwards, so I hope you all will be able to stay. I want to introduce our moderator, who will, of course, introduce our panelists. Um, Jenna Blue Trollet is a junior sociology major at Spelman College, my, also my alma mater. She is from Silver Spring, Maryland, by way of Bonco Mama. Uh, Jenna Blue currently serves as a co-president of the African Students Association here at the Atlanta University Center. She's also assistant vice president of the Spelman Cree Alumni Council and the community service chair for Lighthouse at Morehouse. She is also a Bonner and UPS scholar who volunteers in the West End and surrounding communities. Jenna Blue is looking forward to taking the African Student Association to even greater heights this year in making their presence on campus known more than ever before. Isn't she the perfect moderator for today? <laughs> That's it at all. Can y'all hear me? Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to re reiterate, thank you again for being here despite everything going on within the community. Um, I actually personally know new both students who passed away. Uh, they're both in my grade level, so they would have been juniors. Um, and just thank you all for taking time to be here today, despite everything that's been going on in your lives, regardless of if you knew them or not. Uh, so I just want to go ahead and get started and start introducing our panelists today. I'm actually super excited. Um, so our first panelist today is Mr. Ayo Adimashon. Um, and I actually, I've actually had the opportunity to work with him twice now for the Heggie, so I'm super excited about this one. He's the CEO of Smooth Promotions, an entertainment firm that organizes the Hedys Awards and publishes the weekly hip hop world magazine. In 2013, he led his firm to launch the Hip Hop TV on Multi Choice BSTV. In 2022, he was able to move the Hedys Awards to Atlanta, where the subject and was also the subject of an episode of CNN's World African Voices. Professor Aku Kadogo. She is the chair of the Department of the Theater and Performance at Spelman uh, College. She came to Spelman in 2014-2015, distinguished visiting scholar for the arts. She is an international theater director and choreographer, an arts educator and cultural preservationist. Ms. Kadogo has produced a number of international collaborative interdisciplinary projects. Her Broadway experience has been as an associate choreographer on the Tony Award winning show, Rent, touring Australia, China, and the United States. As a performer, she has worked in film, television, and stage, making her career debut in the original Broadway classic of Four Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough by Utozake Shani. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Well done. Thank you. Next, we have Miss Annabelle Renee McKenzie. She's an African diaspora specialist with a wealth of experience and knowledge on the African continent. She is currently the director of Beyond the Return, Secretaries at the Ghana Tourism Authority, a flagship government initiative aimed at strengthening the relationship between Ghana and the African diaspora. Prior to this, she managed the Year of the Return initiative, a year-long commemoration of the 400th year anniversary of the first documented arrival of enslaved Africans in the United States of America. Before her relocation to Ghana, Annabelle was the Vice President of Digital Marketing of OCD Media in New York from 2016 to 2018, a digital marketing organization that works with consumer products and healthcare brands. Next, we have Dr. David Morrow. He is a longtime faculty member at Morehouse College since 1981 and is currently the Academic Program Director for the Music and Theater and Performance Majors. He conducts the renowned Morehouse College Week Club to domestic and worldwide acclaim, most recently in 2022 for the 50th 
anniversary tour of Nigeria. He also conducts the Window P. Wong Community Chorus and co-directs the Morehouse Spellman Chorus. His conducting honors include performances in such widely varying venues as Atlanta's Symphony Hall with soprano Jesse Norman and the national anthem of the Super Bowl. I actually can't read no Roman numeral, so I have no idea what Super Bowl this is. <laughs> um, with Natalie Cole, the opening and closing ceremonies of the 1996 Atlanta Centennial Olympic Games and on the Masterwork series for the Color of Music Festival in Charleston, South Carolina. And last but not least, we have Ms. Heather Joy Thompson Esquire, who is a lawyer and an award-winning diplomat at the United States Department of the State. She leads the Public Affairs Office at the United States Mission to the African Union in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. She previously served as a representative to the United Nations General Assembly. She is, was also the diplomat in residence and a senior fellow at UCLA. She has served in Washington, D.C., Mexico City, and Johannesburg. Prior to joining the State Department, Heather Joy was a Sean Diddy Combs personal assistant. She is, <laughs> she is also my big Spelman sister, an alumna of Spelman College. Her travels and studies have taken her to more than 40 countries in North America, Europe, Africa, Asia, South America, Central America, and Austria. She has appeared on the Oprah Winfrey Show, Where They Are Now, and in the pages of the New York Times, Town and Country Magazine, Ebony, Jet, and People.com. Those are all our questions. Hello. Uh, I'll just uh, let you all know that we're planning to let each panelist um, share a little bit about the projects they've done. So we will go from right to left, and I have um, content that they've uh, shared with me. Um, so we'll start with um, David Morrow on the right, and then we'll proceed to Aku Kadogo, Heather Joy, um, Annabelle, and then Aya, uh, before proceeding to a, a question and answer period. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. I'm well, quite a record, so if this is too loud, let me know. I tend to talk loud. Uh, thank you for that introduction, and I, I understand about the room. <laughs> uh, what a pleasure it is for me to be here and share with you uh, some work that I have done uh, with the Morehouse College Glee Club, but not myself alone. It begins, this is a journey that begins in 1972 with a State Department tour of West Africa, going to Ghana, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Uganda, and Senegal in 1972, where uh, Dr. Wendell Whalum, my predecessor with the Morehouse College Glee Club, was able to secure this wonderful tour of the Morehouse College Glee Club. So therefore, the connection then is with a an HBCU choral organization sharing our culture and learning culture in West Africa. Uh, the first piece that they uh, sang upon our arrival on the continent was a piece uh, called Gide Tadeo, and it had to do with coming home. And so it was a wonderful occasion. Uh, it was a wonderful tour. Uh, they, they went from place to place singing not only for Nigerian audiences, but also singing with other organizations, other choral organizations, as well as visiting among the people there and, and getting a chance to, to actually witness the culture. In fact, there was a time during that, I forgot which city uh, it was, but they told me there was a time when the, the little buses that they had broke down. And so they ended up having a lot of time with whoever was around. And it, it, they, they often recalled that situation as one of the best experiences of their lives, being able to talk and share with people they didn't know who weren't expecting them to be there all of this became extremely important. But the sharing of the music 
was certainly the main event because it was our task to share American music, African American music as well, and also share these pieces that we learned that were uh, from West Africa, Nigeria specifically. Uh, one of our Morehouse College graduates, Babatunda Olatinji, was, uh, uh, he graduated from Morehouse in 1954. Dr. Whalem, who was the second director of the Glee Club, my predecessor, graduated in 52. And they had a wonderful friendship, and we ended up singing songs that he taught us along the way. So we get to, we fast forward to 1972, and we have this wonderful tour. And it was talked about and is continually talked about. So this collaboration with uh, town and gown, so to speak, meaning uh, the people and those of us who wear academic robes and regalia, ended up being a special situation. So it, that also propelled us in a way to other opportunities for travel. However, one person, Dr. Uz Brown, who is my predecessor as chair of the music department, uh, was in the Glee Club in 1972 and was student director, accompanist, all of that. And so we had the wonderful idea and it worked out. And Dr. Carter Inye helped us with other state department uh, funding to create this point of return that you saw earlier. And so we ended up performing in 2022, 50 years later, in Nigeria. Prior to that last summer, uh, Professor Timothy Miller and I went earlier in January to work with choirs in Nigeria. So they were singing spirituals and some original songs based on spirituals. In fact, one of my colleagues in the audience, Dr. Robert Tanner, wrote a piece that we performed there uh, as well. And so we ended up performing, uh, doing master classes, meaning classes where those students were, the, each choir was performing, and I got to say what was good or bad. <laughs> but they, we learned just as much from them as they might have learned from us. There was a spiritual from the African American experience, an original piece from the African American experience, gospel music that they all did in that January session. As well, you'll see Professor Timothy Miller there. You might recall him from the baseball game seeing God Bless America, when he went with us and sang there. Actually liked it, you know. We, I, I always tell people all the time, 
And so I always get nervous because I any any international travel that I've done with the Morehouse College Glee Club, we're going to do something in the language where we are. I just don't feel I just feel like that's that should be we're always told, well no, they want to hear what you have to do. No, I want to sing some, I want to try. So we've been to Russia, we've been to to, to Poland, I think they was all those African American men of SM and Poland. So uh, you know, and it, it, it the, the 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 endearment that comes as a result makes people become more open. Well, as we share, then we have this wonderful spiritual that Dr. Uzi Brown, who actually made the 50th anniversary trip, by the way. So he had a wonderful moment of connection from his student days to a year before his retirement. And so um, I'm building me a home, you might know from the soundtrack of School Days. But he had written it before, it was a favorite of, of his father's. Uh, Dr. Brown it has uh, four degrees in music from a little place in called Cowpen, South Carolina. <laughs> and so we brought Cowpen, South Carolina to Enugu, Nigeria. There were about 600 secondary students singing with them. experience there. What are the byproducts of such? Uh, one of the things that we are hoping that will happen in the future is certainly some more exchange. If, if, if they say we can go back, I can pack tonight. <laughs> However, more than that, we are hoping that some of these youngsters will also have other avenues for their further study and maybe want to come to Atlanta, to Spelman, to Morehouse, to CAU, to any of the schools in the AU Center, to further their musical studies and other studies and have that as an option and an opportunity. And so those are the kinds of things we want to, to do. So as we have our, uh, uh, our, our wonderful senators on, we took the time in Abuja to sing the college hymn. He is a loyalty true forever, true forever to what Morehouse may be. So to my deeds, sunny earth, into times more bright. I want to, now I can talk about this all day, but we have other panelists who have just equally important things to say. But that's that's a little bit of our story and, and our connection with HBCUs and Nigerian culture and avenues to cultivate that activity. One can't imagine when one is young, when you're on that roller coaster of life, how the threads of that life are going to continuously reoccur like a, like a continuous red thread. And that's what's happened with me, with African culture, and particularly, specifically, Nigerian culture. Uh, when I was 17 years old, just out of high school, I took a literature course taught by the late George Kofi Obuno from Ghana. And it was there that he introduced me to the writers Chinua Achebe and um, Amos Tutuola, the palm wine drinker, which is a story that continues to pique my imagination 
as I go along. So at that same time, I was introduced to the work of Barbara Ann Teer, who's an African-American artist, theater artist, who'd been a dancer on Broadway, and then she created her own theater. I am accepted into school at New York University. I have Barbara Ann Teer on my mind. But the first month that I get to NYU, I was told to go to an auditorium. Get there that night, and you're going to see something wonderful. I get into the room. It's full of Africans. I did not know that they were Nigerian. I'm a kid from Detroit, industrial town. This is my first experience out. And I see several things that are going to stay with me for the rest of my life. There's a, a masquerade that's called Igunuku. And the Igunuku was part of this performance. There was also um, the, the masquerade that's done, the Igunuku, that was also in the show. And I didn't know the name of the theater company and it stayed with me. So as I go along in the journey, I find out 35 years later from the Nigerian scholar Uli Bayer, whom I befriended when he was in his 80s. And he explained to me that that theater company that I saw when I was 18 years old was Duro Latipo and is traveling Yoruba theater. And when the tama player, when the drummer came out and spoke on his talking drum and the entire audience answered back, I was just in awe that the drum could speak a language and that people would know when to respond. This remained with me as part of my theater experience. So then every Sunday I'm going to go now to visit Barbara Ann Tears Theater and she's performing a theater that is really impacted by her time spent in Oshoko and it influences what she's going to do as a ritualized theater, also a forerunner to what I'm going to do with my life. So I get to New York, I see Duro Ladipo, I'm going to Barbara Ann Tears National Black Theater, experiencing this ritualized theater that is also impacted by her visit and her time in Oshoko. Just as I'm getting ready to graduate, a lot of artists in New York are preparing to go to Lagos, to Festac 77. The reason I could not go to Festac 77 was because I was about to open on Broadway in Intizaki Shange's for colored girls who considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. So my life was going to take me in another trajectory. My other friends and family were going to Festac. Festac becomes really important for me. I'm gonna kind of go back and forth because you'll see that this thread continues. I, I got a book last year on Festech 77. And I opened it up the night that I got it. I was very excited about it, very thankful. Festech is really important because it is a festival of the diaspora of African and black people around the world. So this included people from the Pacific, original people from Australia, which is where I ended, I landed, and that is another place I call home now. Um, people from the South Pacific, people from Cuba, all around the world. I opened the book up, and the school that I taught at in Australia for over 20 years, the National Aboriginal Islanders Skills Development Association, founded by an African-American woman named Carol Johnson. I opened it up, and there's the poster that was in our dance studio all those years. Students had been at Festac 77. I did not know this, and coincidentally, Carol Johnson, the founder of that school, was coming to visit me here in Atlanta the next day. And so I presented her with this book and said, you were at Festac. And she said, yes, I was. So this is how Festac continues, really, to come into my life. For colored girls who consider suicide when the rainbow is enough, the term choreo poem has been associated with this form that we are doing, where we're singing, dancing, talking, moving, using our bodies in a vernacular way to express ourselves through this poetic spoken word form. It's a form that intrigued me for all of my working life and a form that I've continued to work on. And so I'm going to now do a, a very fast forward 
to when I got to Spelman in 2014. And I wanted to continue and work in this form. I'm from Detroit originally, as is Heather was a family friend. And I am now working with a poet named Jessica Care Moore, who some of you from Atlanta might know of. Jessica Care Moore created an Afrofuturistic work called Salt City, a techno choreo poem, where we're working with techno music and we're working with the idea of, of we're working underground in the city of Detroit because Detroit is on top of ancient salt mines that go from Ohio, that run from Ohio all through Canada, and Detroit is situated. She created a character, Saul, who it's basically a coming of age story, and she wants to leave as her place, her home, becomes unrecognizable to her through gentrification, through displacement, and we've been working on this piece now. I developed it at Spelman, and so it's a piece that kept going and growing. In 2019, we were the recipients of a generous funding from the Knight Foundation and the Joyce Foundation, and we were able to do that work in Detroit. And are we, is that a little excerpt, Aaron, or just, it's just a still? It's just a still. It's just a still. But we were able to take that work, the idea of that work, from Spelman to Detroit. And then this past year, I've been on sabbatical. We actually performed it at the Apollo, and we're now in conversation with the Apollo Theater's producers about the potential development of that work. So I'm very excited that you can take the idea of a work and continue to develop this choreo poem form. Now the interesting thing about this work, however, was when I did it at Spelman, one of my Morehouse brothers came to me one night and gave me an essay. And the essay was by Isiaba Airobi, a, um, an Igbo scholar who has mentioned, he actually has written about For Colored Girls, as well as the work of August Wilson and Janet Sears, all three of those playwrights I've directed their works. And he says that they have the presence of Hashem in their work and a very deep relationship with Igbo dance dramas and Yoruba theater. And to think that this choreo poem is a form, my Morehouse brother thought, listen, you need to read this writer. I get then, a few years, Dr. Carter Enyi invited me to come to Insoka. And he kept saying, your work is like an Igbo dance drum. You've got to understand what you're doing here. So I get to Insoka, and my colleague, who actually is here with me today, I would like to mention, Dr. Ngozi Udengu is here, from visiting from the University of Nigeria. She takes me to the bookstore, and there's a book called The African Diaspora, Theater and the African Diaspora. I'll open the book up, there's Isiaba Arobi again, and there is his essay on For Colored Girls, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and The Adventures of a Black Girl in Search of God, all three works that I've directed and been in myself, saying, stating their Africanist presence in the, all of these works. So it was my trip to uh, Inugu State and I got to also see a, a production called Nigeriana that was produced by my colleagues there at the University of Minnesota. And I think that's also a still, Aaron? Yes. And I would like to mention um, that all the videos and pictures we're referencing are stored in the AUC Library archives. Yes. Um, so um, would you like me to bring up a video? No, that's all right, because okay. we have a lot of people to go oh. over this one. But anyway, that's, that is how, I, and it took me all those years from when I was 18 years old to finally get to Nigeria in 2021 and connect all of these threads that have been so very important to me in my work, that have inspired me, inspired my creativity and imagination, and continues to develop it. And, and the story, so now I know that the story isn't finished. It's going to go on and on. So. As far as people say, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah.
thank you all for coming this morning, and I'd like to just reiterate Andrea's um, expression of sorrow and um, condolences to the young men who died in the community, to all those who were affected by the loss. I know that this is the sort of thing that can really undo people and have reverberations that go on for quite a long time. So all respect to those young men and their families. So before I get started, I would like to acknowledge my family and friends who have come, Kelly and Keith Joyner, and also Ms. Aku, who mentioned briefly that oh, our families were connected. It's a little bit deeper than what that, said on. yes. yes. <laughs> so um, Kelly's father, Aku's father, and my mother all worked together for many, many years at Ford Motor Company. We are all Detroiters, and we have a certain grounding in the experiences of blackness. Mm -hmm. And for me, that started in Detroit, but was also reinforced here in Stallman when I arrived here as a student um, at 18 years old. It continued a month after I graduated from Spellman and went to Burkina Faso, West Africa as a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, I like to cook, and I think about flavors and sort of like uh, in terms of being in families. So you have the Allium family, which includes garlic and onions and ramps and leeks. And those things are not all the same. Like they have different properties and they lay in different characteristics of whatever you're cooking. But at the end of the day, you know when food has allium in it. If the garlic is missing or if the onions are missing, you're like, mm, something is not quite right here. Like it needs a little flavor. And so I would equate my experiences as a black American, having lived now in three different African countries, in addition to traveling to a whole bunch of other places and seeing how the diaspora represents itself around the world as being in a family like the Allen family. We are not all the same, or we are, our experiences are not monolithic, but there's a connection there, there's a flavor there that when it shows up, you recognize it immediately. I've had the privilege and the honor of being a U.S. diplomat at the Department of State for 15 years. Um, I'm 27, so you guys do the math. Uh, but, but the majority of my career has been at the State Department, and I've seen the formal structures that have uh, been stood up over the years to support engagement between the African American community and um, African diaspora around the world. The Biden Harris administration has done an amazing job of really formalizing some of those structures. And uh, as a matter of housekeeping, well, I want you to to write down careers at state.gov and uh, state.gov slash ECA, which stands for Educational and Cultural Affairs. And those are the two sites where you can find out a lot of information that uh, about our programming, including our scholarships, our fellowships, and different opportunities for international engagement. We have a ton of uh, resources for students and professionals. Your taxpayer dollars pay for those, and, but a lot of people don't know how to access them and take advantage of them. But we do have those. Um, and the Biden and Harris administration has also sort of formalized the engagement between the African American community and the African diaspora through an executive order. Um, but my benefit, I think, with being here today is not to talk about the formal programming of the State Department. We have someone on campus here who's our diplomat resident who can give you all the information that you may need as students about how to formally engage the State Department and those, uh, those structures that we have in place to help develop relationships formally. I want to highlight today, though, something that has occurred over this last year in my position in Ethiopia, um, directing our public diplomacy shop. And I think it is apropos of the student experience because it doesn't rely on sort of a formal outreach. It was really just two people who put their back into it and figure out a way. Like we are way makers. We have come over the ocean and crisscrossed transatlantic uh, slave trade. A lot of us came up north through the Great Migration. Like we are folks who always had to kind of figure out a way in. Even when that way was not clear, we had to walk on faith and we had to understand that the goals can be accomplished even if the path is not clear before us. And so there are two gentlemen, uh, Jeremiah and Jerome Jones, a father and son painting duo from Virginia. And they had had no engagement with State Department programming. They were not, you know, any, we have a lot of really amazing alumni network, uh, and they were not part of any of that. Uh, they did a bit of research and found our then ambassador's email address. 
and wrote to her. And it was the most not basic, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but just a very straightforward sort of like, we're artists and we'd like to come to Africa, so can you help us out? And that created a domino effect. So she was outgoing, her name is Jessica Penn. She uh, left her post in January and they wrote her on the very last day of, of her time in Ethiopia. And she said, I'm gonna refer you to our public affairs person who can probably help you. And so when I read this, I was like, hmm, we organize our year in a very structured way. And our money is allocated you know, a year in advance of when it's spent. And we normally don't have you know, pots of money just lying around <laughs> to, to do uh, all ad hoc programming. But this year we did. And so I called the Joneses and I'm like, well, tell me exactly how you'd like to see this develop. What is your vision? They're like, well, we don't really know. We've never been to Africa. We've never been outside of the US. We don't know what to ask of you, but we just know that we have this artwork that we'd like to share and we'd like to come to Africa. And I'm like, you know what, I don't know either, but we're gonna figure this out. And so over about two months, we planned an engagement, a week-long um, series of events for them in, in Addis Ababa. So they came over, they were the first African-American artist to show in the exhibition hall at the African Union. Um, so for them, this was major. Most people travel for their first time kind of on the humble, just figuring it all out. They came in, you know, as an executive level um, with a full program. And it was a moment of pride for me, just not only you know, as a participant, but also to see folks who are just regular, ordinary working artists. They're not fancy, they're not attached to any university, they don't have the kind of access that comes from being attached to a formal institution. They just put their back into it. They're willing to take a chance and hope for a good response, and that's what they got. And so my encouragement to all the young people who are looking to travel is to just to do that, you know, it, the way is not always going to be clear, but there are always folks along the road who will help you, who have the information that you need, if only you were to ask for it. And I cannot tell you how many angels I have met along the way. I mean, there are situations I wouldn't even share with my parents because I'd probably be dead now, either from the situation or from my parents' response to it. And folks who have just said, you know, let me help this little girl. She is foolish, um, but she still deserves to move on. And so, you know, over all these years, I, the first time I went abroad was, um, you know, by myself, was when I was a student at Spelman. I did my study abroad in Italy, and that was a number of years ago, and I've just been kind of on the go ever since. And I don't have any particular skill set, um, but I did have a lot of faith and determination and uh, just drive to sort of see my aims come to, to light. And I think that will serve you guys as students no matter what you choose to engage. Um, so I would encourage you to, again, go to careers.state.gov, look at our different formal opportunities for engagement, um, both as professionals and as students, but also to just sort of seize the opportunity to look at the world as being your, your, your playground. There's so many ways to connect now. We didn't have the benefit of WhatsApp and uh, Facebook, or I don't know if for you guys, but you know, or TikTok, there was none of that. It was just, you know, we had very rudimentary tools. You guys have extremely sophisticated technological tools to help not only build engagement, but maintain it, and to connect with folks around the world. I had the, benefit of the opportunity to go to the Hedys uh, the other night, and it was amazing to see all these Afrobeat artists, some of whom I know, but others that were brand new to me, so I was on my phone, like, okay, well, let me look up this one on iTunes. And so now I have a whole new uh, music vocabulary in my big age, still learning something brand new every single day. And I would just encourage you guys to really take the opportunity to become lifelong learners and to make connections, to remember that onion now your mix, and, you know, to put your back into it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Annabelle McKenzie, and just to give a little bit of background about myself, I'm African American, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, but my father used to always tell us growing up, Africa is home, never forget that, even though he had never visited Africa. Um, I think a defining moment in my life, in Denver, we used to have one of the largest Martin Luther King um, parades every year, and back in the 90s, when we would have the parades, um, the Ku Klux Klan would also come out to do their protests. 
during the parades. And so it was always a defining moment for me because I always felt like America wasn't where I belonged, but I didn't necessarily know where I did belong. Um, when it was time for undergrad, I went to Grambling State University, another HBCU in Louisiana. And after graduating, I was fortunate to work for Chevron, the oil company. And during my time there, I worked in Angola, Nigeria, Australia, and other places around the US. So my first experience actually getting to Africa was through work in Angola was that first country. And so as I progressed with my career, I started working for Deloitte Consulting, doing management consulting, which was a lot of hours. If you graduate and go into consulting, you may work 100 hour weeks. So after doing that for about 40 years, I quit Deloitte, um, I was around 30 years old, and I said I need to figure out what I'm going to do next with my life. So I traveled the world for two years, got my master's degree part-time at NYU, and while I was traveling, I went back to the continent, went to Tanzania, Kenya, and other countries, um, traveled around Europe and Asia. Started working again for a media company as a vice president of digital marketing, and I was there for about six months, and the exact date was September 11th, 2017. Um, it was a real bad day at work. I was the only black person working at this media company, and it was a pretty racist vice president that was my counterpart. And so that day, I even have the Facebook post. I made the decision that I was going to move to Tanzania at, by the end of the next year. Because Tanzania was the country in Africa that when I went there, I had a spiritual connection. Um, different things happened, and I ended up moving to Ghana in May of 2018. It has definitely been one of the best decisions I've made in my life to return home to Ghana. You know, I always tell people that I've lived the American dream, or the quote unquote American dream, and so now I'm living the African dream. And one of my major goals in life is to build Africa to what she would have been had it not been for slavery and colonization. And so my role working for Ghana Tourism Authority as the director of Year of Return and now Beyond the Return has allowed me to do those different things. One of the biggest things on Beyond the Return is that we have seven foundational pillars. I think it's on slide three. And two of those key pillars are Celebrate Ghana and Brand Ghana. So with Celebrate Ghana, we are celebrating Ghanaian traditions, culture, history, customs, and norms. And in brand Ghana, the focus is, as Africans, we have to own our own narrative. The West can't continue to tell our stories because our stories are normally told as poverty. Um, we're impoverished, feed the children, we need help with everything. But if you actually move to the continent and travel around and live there, Africa, Ghana, it's a wonderful country. The life that I live in Ghana is better than my life here. So with Brand Ghana, we have different initiatives with content and creativity so we can tell our stories. Um, when it comes to HBCUs and different universities, we have a strategic partnership with Howard University, and we do a lot of programs with Howard. Um, next month, we're having a big event that's called Ghana Week DC, where there'll be a series of cultural events, business events, and the highlight is we're actually bringing one of the Ghanaian football teams from Ghana to play DC United, and it would be um, the Africa City Cup that will happen on October 14th um, next month. We've also hosted a delegation of students from Georgia State University from their CMII department. They came out about two, two months ago, it was a class, and they came to Ghana for the purposes of actually capturing content, and that content we will utilize at Ghana Tourism Authority. But a lot of them, it was their first time actually coming to the continent. And there are several universities that come to Ghana um, with different departments, but they all lead with a lot of content. And so what I want to say to the students here when we talk about Africa and content and creativity is we need students 
to learn about Africa, to love Africa, and tell the African story. We need to own our narrative and tell the story in our way. Um, some other things that we do, if we go to another slide, I think the last slide. One thing, as the director of Beyond the Return, I sit on a lot of panels. I travel to the U.S. about in the Caribbean about six or seven times a year. Um, last month, I went to Essence Festival. Essence Film Festival actually had an Africa House for the first time, and there were about four countries represented. Nigeria was there, Ghana, um, I think South Africa, and maybe Rwanda. And so there were film producers, directors, people from the entertainment industry that promoted Africa and the richness of what we have on the continent. We also do a series called The Return Conversations that will focus on a topic to bridge the gap between the diaspora and Ghana. So we just had a good industry talk last month and the theme was the role of film in the music industries um, in uniting the global diaspora family. And so for that, we will bring people from America and merge them with Ghanaians so we can figure out how to merge that gap. We have upcoming relationships um, going on with Warner Music. We work with a lot of companies in the entertainment industry to ensure that we're getting the creative industry out there. Um, if you look under our National Film Authority Department, there are a lot of incentives that will be implemented to have international filmmakers and producers come to Ghana to actually make movies. My department has worked with a lot of creators when they want to come to Ghana to shoot content and movies. So if you want to come to Ghana to film a movie or do something in the creative industry, if you reach out to us, we will help you navigate through that process with your licenses, getting your equipment there, um, making sure that you have qualified crew. Because it's important if people are gonna come to Ghana to film a movie, you need to use locals also to do the work, not just import people to do the work. So that's high level about Beyond the Return and Year of Return. I'm so happy to be here. I'm a proud HBCU grad. I'm also a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So I love coming back to HBCUs to have discussions like this. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ayo Adimasham. Um, Dr. Ayo, you want to play this? To the the 16th edition of the Headings Award, Africa's most prestigious music awards, took place in September 3rd, 2023. The Cobb Energy Center in Atlanta, USA. This glamorous event themed celebrating African Renaissance featured dazzling fashion on the red carpets and celebrated outstanding contributions to the music industry. The night was filled with captivating performances by Africa's finest talents, including Asha Ken, Udwood Black, Shea Vibes, Black Bones, Spyro, Young John, Wandeko, Casey, and Black Sheriff. This artist showcased their versatility and stage presence, making it a memorable evening. <laughs> Yeah, um, 
Bash Al Amdi um, found out and the executive producer of the Eddies. Um, the Eddies is simply our uh, own version of the Grammys. Uh, it's the biggest and most prestigious music awards out of Africa. And um, I tell you just that the Eddies, it's been a long journey. I started my career in um, media and entertainment close to 30 years ago. I was on publishing I started quite early, over 30 years ago actually. I started by publishing um, a book, some book that had so many lyrics. Then there was no internet, so if you wanted to learn lyrics to popular songs, you had to buy my song book. Uh, then it moved to like a, a music journal. A music journal we had um, stories, facts, and about contemporary artists way back then, and that was in the early 90s. It was our old version for people that are here. Of, it was our old version of Right On, Black Beat, The Vibe Magazine, or Source Magazine, way back then. And it was quite popular. We were all through the country. And um, then we thought there was a need for a music award, you know, that would uh, reward urban contemporary music, you know, and. Uh, Rather than join, you know, the list of people that would just complain about everything, we decided to create one, and that was why Hip Hop World Award started. We, we that became the Eddies because it was an award ceremony by Hip Hop World magazine, which was the magazine we had at that time. Um, and of course, it became, you know, accepted. It became big. The first few years, and the first award was very, very successful, and we built success of the of the awards. Uh, then by the next year um, we decided to start Hip TV. Hip TV is um, now a big household name in, in Nigeria. We are in 44 countries across Africa. I'll call it our own version of PET and probably MTV put together. You know uh, we have our entertainment news every day. We have interviews, we have you know behind the scenes, we have TV program, we have news program, we have sport program. You know, um, MTV is that channel that is um, that every young man you know, likes to watch to know what is happening in and outside of the country. And um, of course, that's in 2007. Of course, MTV didn't start as a 24-hour channel. We started as a 30-minute program syndicated on all other you know popular channels. And before it became its own channel on a network in 2013. Um, and after that, we've been, you know, we've continued with the 80s. And all the uh, superstars, uh, even all the superstars, probably all of them that you now know that in the US, from Whiskey to Bonner Boy to Asha K to MI to David o, at one point or the other, needed the platform to step up you know, and uh, they won major awards at the edges. Um, what I do actually really speak for itself because it, it's the media, it's out there. Um, in 2021, we made a decision to bring the edges to the US. And um, of course, a lot of people back home you know, were like against this. Why would you bring our awards to America? It's our award. <laughs> and uh, uh, the fact is that uh, we thought through everything very well. And um, we, we thought, you know, we needed to showcase more of our talents to the world. And everything will not happen in our backyard. You know, we, sometimes you get into this bubble and we believe everything we do is just around us. And now that our music is gaining, you know, Afrobeat is gaining momentum around the world. And who are listening to Africa from the around the world. The culture, the music is bigger than just the few players that are known around the world. There's so many collaborations that can happen, so many talents out there. There's so many talents that you won't even believe it. You won't believe it. And, um, the first thing we did was to um, look for the right partners and if you would showcase and you know talents to to the world. 
in America, you know, or through this platform here in America, you have to first do something, be able to come here, you know, and uh, we partner with the US consulate, you know, and uh, they, they were very happy to partner with us. You know, we even had, you know, they hosted the event, you know, and the partners and the nominees to the reception before coming to the US. We now also went to the state government, you know, and uh, we partner with the state as well. When we are coming to America, we needed to partner with guys that, that are in, in a position to help you know, with um, making this happen. Then, of course, we look for local sponsors. When we were starting new in America, we needed to come with our sponsors. You know, it would not just happen here because you know, we are coming for the first time. We look for local sponsors to partner with us. And we at the event last year at Cobb Energy Center. Same Labor Day weekend, last year was 4th of September. And, um, because it was our first time, we didn't quite, I didn't quite uh, think it was up to that level of what we, the brand is used to and what I'm used to, what the front, they are there, what the fans are there used to. So we decided to repeat the same thing this year and, um, and do it better. And that was what happened. Two days ago, a cop in the Senate, um, bringing in more of the Afrobeat superstars, you know, trying to showcase them. You know, got media partners. Um, Fox Five was there, CNN was there, was on CBS, and a lot of um, big media networks and partners in America came to the uh, to attend the edits. And uh, of course, back home it was was really big. We had over six billion impressions. You know, even till today, we're still trending. You know, um, top 10, 15 trend was about the edges. And that's where we are right now. Thank you. So I have a few questions myself that I'm going to go ahead and ask the panelists. And then from there, we're going to open it up for you all to also ask questions. Um, so I would say the first question is proposed to all of you all. Um, what advice do you have for students who are interested in working internationally, whether they are current international studies majors or not, or they don't really know how to go about it, but they know that they want to expand um, their experiences across the world, whether that be within the continent of Africa, or that be Europe, or Asia, or any other continent that there is. What advice can you give to them um, to really getting exposure and then getting their foot in the door and truly pursuing a career that is fulfilling for them? I would say be brave, first of all. Secondly, don't plan a vacation. <laughs> have a plan, have an idea, and make sure it's something that you want to find out about, but not something that told, somebody told you to find out about. I mean, you have to have some guidance, and that makes some sense. But make sure it's something that you want to find out about, and then that will lead you to perhaps ask the right questions. I mean, you have to be brave enough when I say brave enough, brave enough to go, brave enough to be open, and brave enough to ask the right folk. Be brave enough to walk up to somebody like some of the panelists and say, I don't know you, who are you, can you tell me something? You never know who you're going to be talking to. And, and, and make sure you represent yourself well. And more, uh, with the students that, I, that do go overseas, if they have a special field that they're interested in, I always encourage them to go beyond the borders of what's being presented for them and seek that out. I know specifically in the discipline of theater, our students sometimes feel deprived of getting that. I say, you have to go yourself and find out. Maybe go to the theater, listen to theater in another language, find out who the workers are. Don't be afraid at all, and it's the same thing, no fear. And also introduce yourself, and you never, ever, ever know who's in the room with you. 
and that they too are going to look. I always say to my students, I said, just as much as you're looking for opportunities, they're actually looking for you. So present yourself well, truly. I have a, a few things. I would say, first of all, when you're abroad, however you get there, it is important to go away from the resort, yep. get on the bus, take the train. When you're at the resort, don't just you know greet your your uh, concierge or the cleaning people and say hi. Ask them actually, like, where should I go eat? Um, the resort restaurant is not where you should be going to eat. No disrespect to the resorts, but you're not going to get the sense of anybody's culture by just staying on these curated experiences that are you know designed to keep you on campus. I want you to get off campus and go and really get to know the society that you're supposed to be engaging. Um, it's very, very easy to recreate these sort of westernized structures, even socially, when you are abroad. I cannot tell you the number of times I've lived abroad and people are like, well, we're going to go to the Olive Garden and then go home. And I'm like, really? <laughs> In Mexico City, of all the things that we have, that's, what, that's the plan that you came up with. I mean, you know, do you? You have to live your life in a way that makes sense, but I would encourage you to really kind of go beyond that and figure out what people are doing at every single level in the society. When you're going in as students or young professionals, and most times as, as Westerners and as Americans, you're coming in at a very high point um, within that particular society. You're going to be given certain access, and that can be great and it's comfortable. But I would say also find out what the working class people where you're visiting are doing. What are the teachers' experiences? How are they engaging in the culture? Because that's when you're really going to get a sense of the vibe of the country, of what moves it, of the politics. All the information that you need to know is not going to be found in the confines of the academy or at the results. So get out there and do it. Um, one thing I would say is take advantage of any programs your university may have for alternative spring break. Um, I know with Howard, they do alternative spring break where the students decide what country they want to go to. So a lot of students have come to Ghana during that spring break. Also, when you're looking at your career and where you want to go, there are several companies where you have a high likelihood of getting placed abroad. Um, working for an oil and gas company, you will have a high likelihood of being able to go abroad. Um, and I would also say, just go on your own and make sure you build relationships. In West Africa in particular, a lot of things happen in person. Relationship building is very important. I know when I moved to Ghana, it's the people that I got to know in my network that allowed me to be successful. And I wasn't able to find and say that information online. And then when you're working, um, one of my things was I never said no to any opportunity. You know, I started working in Texas, and I remember my boss came to me on a Friday, and he was like, will you move to California? And it was Friday morning, and he came back that afternoon. He was like, no, I need you to move on Monday. And so I moved three days later to California. I had never been there. And so in my career, when I started off, I just said yes to every opportunity, even if I was scared to do it. So just take that risk. Okay, yeah, I'd like to add that some things start slow and um, don't get disappointed when you don't find results the first week or month. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen or it's not going to happen in peak. Uh, you have to be patient and be, be consistent and uh, you have to learn to also persevere and um, make, make friends and speak with people and stay focused, know why you're there and just keep knocking. Thank you. My second question, uh, it's very generic, but I always feel like it's a very important question to ask. Um, if you all could discuss your greatest successes slash accomplishments within your field, but also your greatest challenge that you faced in all the years that you've been at it, for example. <laughs> oh, um. Everything I did uh, before I start, started at all didn't make sense to anybody. The amount when I said I wanted to publish a magazine, it did not make sense because it was a specialist magazine that was not before it. So everything was an experiment. But, um, I did uh, my own experiment that I believed in. And uh, I molded 
everything I created with my own clay. And it was everybody around me, almost everybody around me disappointed. So um, almost everybody around me, you know, did not have anything good to say about it. They did not believe in it, almost everybody. And one thing that you have to be convinced yourself and, you know, be focused and just believe in it. Then maybe other people can do it. If you, help, if you want other people to believe in it before you do it, you probably will not get anything new done. And uh, that's one. Number two, I remember when, um, and, and this example, um, I was going to get married and um, I met my father in law for the first time. And uh, he asked me, Do you want my mother in law asked me a lot of questions? You know, young man, you know, he asked me about life. She asked me about life in general, and the man was just looking at me, and he asked me the one question, young man, what do you do? Because he wanted a man that would be responsible enough to be able to take care of his wife. And he said, I put out the magazine that was published at that time, because at that time I had a pitu, a Volkswagen pitu, we call it Volkswagen pitu, that before I knocked your door, you would know that I was in your neighborhood, because my car would be making noise. <laughs> So, um, a young man, what do you do? And I probably brought out the magazine. And this is why I, know I published this magazine. He said, he said I don't mean your hobby. Yeah. Your job. At that point, it didn't look like a job. But, but now we're here. So you have to believe in it and keep doing it. Yeah. My greatest success now is the work that I'm doing on the continent in enabling Africans to come back to Africa. When people come to Ghana who have never been to the continent and you see their experience, their expression, the emotional connection, I know that I'm doing the work that God meant for me to do. So right now, this is my greatest accomplishment. I have set out to do that I have achieved. Um, and the, the continuing thread that I, we spoke about for me is just really having relationships, starting from the ones in childhood, but also going across the world now, uh, that have allowed me to both represent you all as part of uh, the US government, as an official US government representative, to explain our story to the world. Um, people, depending on where you go in the world, have very different perceptions of the United States. Most of the time, their understanding is not fulsome. Um, they may have a piece on an issue that's very interesting to them, but they don't get the entire picture, and they certainly don't understand the story of my people and how we got here, what we have accomplished here, um, and how we're moving in the continent. They have a very narrow, limited view in the main of what, what it means to be American, but specifically what it means to be black American. And so having the chance to really engage in people-to-people -people contact um, to explain the American story, good and bad. You know, we have to take what we've done around the world holistically and not just focus on the things that we've done that are amazing because we have a whole lot of parts that are not so shiny and we have to own those too. And I, I'm happy to do it. Like, I'm on the receiving end of some of the bad things that have happened in this country, um, but we still have to provide that context. But really getting to know other human beings and how they have grown up to see their, how their cultures have developed to understand the beauty of their societies has been, I think, the enduring sort of high point of, of what I've done around the world. Uh, I just, oh, I, I didn't realize everybody was going to that. When you all are done, I wanted just to announce that we do have four students that either performed at the Hennies or volunteered there, including Jennifer Booth herself, and also um, Schneider, who went on the Nigeria trip. So I'd love to, you know, if. Once, once you all um, share your greatest experience, love to get the students involved with the conversation in some way. If not, put you guys on the spot. I'm going. Am I still on? Yes. Um, it's hard. I'm, I'm like Heather. It's kind of hard to. It's hard to really state one's life when you're in it and you're doing it. I mean, greatest accomplishment is waking up every day. 
and being grateful. Um, I'm excited. I am excited about working with young people, and I've had the opportunity to work with young people around the world. And to see that you find this commonality in your humanity, and that you can take this forward, and that I can continue to inspire people to seek out. I always say that I'm attempting to unearth people's creativity. And I think that is one of my gifts. The short answer, uh, the, <clears throat> my greatest accomplishment is my challenge. And that's to do something tomorrow better than I did today. And if I don't, in all these years I've been at Morehouse College, consider myself a lifelong learner, then I'm nothing as a teacher to start with. And secondly, I hope that tomorrow is going to be better than today. So I've got to do something better tomorrow than I did today. And that, and then the next one will be the next biggest thing. And hopefully, at least strive to that. I know that sounds like I'm getting out of the answer, so I can let these young people talk, and it is. But, but, but I, I do believe that. I mean, I, I'll let somebody else say what my best accomplishment, accomplishment was. I don't need to say that. I'll let, I'll, my mother, God bless her soul, said, if your work speaks for itself, shut up. Yeah. So I want to just take a second to acknowledge um, we don't have any students here today because of the tragedy that happened, but we do have four students who actually um, have been involved with the projects we talked about, including the Headings and the Glee Club Tour. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge Buka, who is a senior at Morehouse, and he played the Oja. Uh, so Dr. Moore plays Oja, but he played at the Headies. So um, you're the one who told me to watch. Um, and, and so then we also have Brian Duncan, who was um, the, the president of the African Students Association uh, last year when we had a, a wonderful concert and our first collaboration with the Headies. Um, then we also have Schneider Grand Pierre, who has volunteered at the Headies, performed at the Headies last year, or was supposed to. That's another story, but he was there all day to do it. Um, and also went on the Glee Club tour. And he also went on study abroad um, with me to Nigeria. So he's been to Nigeria twice, and I think he's planning to do a Fulbright as well. So um, he's, he's certainly somebody that's taking, you know, jumping at all these opportunities you're talking about. And of course, Jenna Boo, who has just been, it's been like a full-time job the last few weeks. Um, so I would love it if you, each of you would share, um, you know, about a little bit about that experience and kind of talk back to us just a little bit about what we need to do to facilitate um, this work so that there's more students engaging the way you have. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chukwe Buka, I'm from Lagos, Nigeria. And I'm wrestling for one of them, from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, with me being involved with the Eddies, uh, it was, I'll say it was by fate. Um, I met, I performed, I played the Oja for KC last night. And um, I met him at a convention about three weeks ago. It was called UIU Umuibu, the United Convention. And I met him there in you know, the of his music. I had my audio table, I was performing there as well. And he heard me play it, and I followed him backstage. I spoke with him, and he got my number. And uh, I saw he was coming to perform at the Headies, and I, you know, I hit him up, and he told me, yeah, you know, he hit me up, and you know, I helped coordinate. I brought on the masquerades, brought on my cultural troupe, and they were able to uh, perform at the, at the event, and you know, added more color to the event, and I feel like, this, maybe it's not this time, me being biased, but I feel like this performance was one of the best performances of the night, if you ask me. Um, you know, I grew up watching the Hedies, you know, being a big fan of everything, like, but just me being in that room, that vicinity, seeing people I only see on TV, even growing up, even Mr. I or there himself, and it was just so surreal. Uh, so I do, 
I appreciate the opportunity. I love the fact that African culture is being given uh, the merit it deserves, you know, as it had a huge influence to a lot of things uh, in the world. Um, down to every, African culture has a, a lot of huge significance in the music or in the, a lot of different cultures in the world. And the fact that the Eddies were brought into um, to the U.S., I see it as a, a huge opportunity to bring together our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, right? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing. I, I would love for it to, to continue being done. Um, in terms of, um, I think you asked some, something, you asked a question about improvement. What can we do to facilitate this more, make it easier for other students? Um, you know, what, what can we Are we do? talking about the Eddies or? Uh, well, what? I think in general, um, to get students with um, engaging with, with Africa and the arts. The, okay. The, the general. So, at first, I, I believe this it starts from understanding the psyche of the students, right? Uh, understanding, you know, the things, kind of things they like. Uh, it's, I feel like it all comes with presentation, you know. Um, I know Caribbean culture is more, I would say, it's more, uh, what's the word? Brian, help me with this. Um, you want to say attractive to young people? Yes. Uh, we we'll say here in America, Caribbean culture is more, you know, quote unquote, attractive to young people here. And I, I feel like it's because of the way it's, um, it's given to them, you know, it's, I feel like it's more like fun activities, you know, um, that it comes from Caribbean culture. But uh, when, and in the past with the ASA, when I accepted the treasurer last year, when we've tried to you know, host events that showcase African culture, you know, in its fullest, the turnout hasn't been that great. But I think just, I believe the best way would be to find a way to just weave it in with something that is easy for them to assimilate and understand, you know. And that would, I, feel, I believe that that would be a way for us to see an increase in student engagement, you know, uh, with things that pertain to African culture. Thank you. Hello, my name is Schneider Rampier. I am a senior music major with an emphasis in piano performance from Photo Prince IET by way of, well, from Atlanta, Georgia by way of Photo Prince IET. And uh, last year, last summer, I went to study abroad with uh, Dr. Carter and me. Uh, and we went to study abroad for three weeks. We went to Abuja, then we went to Lagos, and then we went to Suga. We spent two weeks in Suga and then we spent one week in Lagos, and we were there to help get ready for the Morehouse College Elite Club tour, and to help set things up and to learn more about the entertainment industry in Nigeria itself. And I feel like that experience within itself and interacting within the culture helped me learn more about not only my roots and how it relates to me being a Haitian and how the historical uh, emphasis of how my people may have came from Nigeria itself, seeing the cultural handoffs that I recognize in Nigeria, seeing the little um, ways that the people interact is so similar to the way that my family interacts back in Haiti, or the family that I have in the United States, our nation interacts, seeing those little um, nuances and seeing the little differences as well. And seeing that connection um, made me want to go back and learn more about it. And the, the tour itself, being able to perform with uh, Nigerians and being able to perform in their language and being able to sing in Igbo, sing in Yoruba, and getting that cultural exchange really helps me see and helps me understand the greater scope and how we can interchange the different experiences, even though that it's been separated through many years of trauma, being separated by many generations. We still have that same connection. We still have that same shared heritage. And we still have that same shared story of pain and trauma, but also of hope, of perseverance, and of just shared growth. And um, what I plan to do is also 
just furthering my experience and furthering my knowledge in Nigerian and Nigerian culture. And well, so the question, um, you know, what, so what can we do that we haven't already done? You've told us what we've done, so what, what can we do even more to uh, facilitate experiences I would, like this? I would say just talking to students more about Nigerian culture and just talking more about African culture as a whole, just having those open conversations of, about what it is and how it might work, and also maybe provide scholarship opportunities yeah, for people. Say that money. <laughs> so, because it's also not cheap <laughs> to go to Nigeria. And it was, uh, and with going to, we thought we went there, it was paid for. And that was, all easy, that was easily how a lot of us was able to go to I know I would have been able to go twice if well, I had even to. Even our study abroad had scholarships. Yes, right. With the study abroad, I didn't have to pay that much for it. I, it was a huge a reduction in the scholarship. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been able to go. So, would it be accurate to say that those representatives, I don't know if there's foundations here, but those representatives of government that are here, we would like to see a continued support for these programs? Yes, <laughs> Myself. My name is Brian Duncan, originally from uh, Bijonka Duval, um, where I was also raised in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. I'm currently a senior at the Elysius Morris College, where I'm an economics major uh, and a mathematics minor. Last year, I had the privilege to serve as the ABC African Association president, and it was the first year that we got to be involved with the ABC. Um, being a student, an African student on an ABCU campus because everybody is black, you know. Um, I feel like it's very important to educate on cultures of the diaspora. So one of my goals coming to the position was to make everybody understand on this campus that the ACSA, even though this is about creating a safe space for African, it's mainly about educating my brother and sister in the ABC, right? And we did that, um, organized a lot of events. Um, my past board members and current president got invested. I think it was 40 something, took a lot of work, um, brought back a lot of events. And like I said, I had the opportunity to work with the heads for the first time ever. And I feel like to answer Professor Carter's question, it's a constant effort when you want to educate people. It's a constant effort that never ends. You want to end with me, you want to end with Jenny Boo, you want to end with the president after her. It's constant. It's always new people that come in, new freshmen from a part, different part of the USA that are, don't know anything about African culture. And I feel like the ACSA has the opportunity to be the introduction to it by collaborating with organizations like the Hedges or study over programs at Moros. I myself have done study over program at Moros that took me to Ghana and Senegal for free, like my brother right here, um, the International uh, Moros Spring Tour. Um, so how can the institutions that are present here do a better job, right? In my opinion, um, the Hedges is a well-organized event. Uh, I feel as though as we all event, there's always room for improvement. Maybe with communication with volunteers. I was a volunteer last year and a volunteer this year. Always a lot of fun working with the, and you know, working the eddies and getting to see stars or, you know, just getting more hands-on experience as an event planner. And um, I feel like an improvement that I saw from last year to this year was the involvement of students, right? Last year, the only schools that were involved were the HC schools. This year, I got to see folks I knew from Georgia State University, Kansas State University. What I would like to see next year would be folks from Georgia Tech, Georgia State, Kansas, all the schools that are around out of their ASA involved as well. 
Because at the end of the day, who listens to those artists if not young people, right? And um, as far as, for example, the State Department is concerned, um, I totally agree. You know, we still already have fellowship and scholarship, but never have too much scholarships and fellowships. <laughs> so um, yeah, and support the organization. You know, um, like I say, we are the gateway for students originally to the culture, and one of our biggest issues that's, that will always remain is our quest for funding. You know, it's one thing to see somebody, have a conversation with a person. Hey, you know, we plan to have this big event show this afternoon culture by the end of the spring semester. And they view their work, but when it's time to give out their wallet, something else. So supporting student organizations that are trying to open and expand the mind of every student at least on the A on the AC is also a way that um, an organization can improve. But thank you. Um, so I'm just gonna first and foremost start off with on Sunday night I met my favorite rapper in the world. I met Wale. Thanks for the hangies. Um I as since I was a volunteer, I tried not to pay girl and I cut my composure, but I definitely got selfies. I'm going to get them printed and framed. Um, but that being said, last year I was not a volunteer. I was just a spectator, so I was in the stands watching the show. This year I did get to volunteer backstage and be uh, very hands-on. I was also the coordinator for the volunteers this year. Um, it was definitely a very large learning experience. I like to tell people I don't have a set career path. I like to dibble dabble in everything. Um, so being able to see what this looks like on this side, you know, I don't do a lot of um, major event planning. Well, I like to do surprise birthday parties and I'll plan the friend group's brunch or whatever like that. But this was something that was major on another scale. So making sure all the volunteers were fed and that they knew where to go, that they had tasks, that they were okay, if they were chilling and laid back, uh, that they had transportation was something that was very important to me. Um, and it was, it was very fun. I'm, everyone who volunteered or even attended said they had a good time, they were able to enjoy themselves. Um, and currently, you know, in our state um, with the ASA, just capitalizing off what we did last year, as Buka and Brian said, moving forward, it's really just about exposure and getting students to really um, be interested and attracted to it. As Buka explained, you know, um, which is often one of our problems, but we often get confused with the um, AUC Caribbean Association vibes. You know, there have been oftentimes the not where students who know me personally like, oh, you're a vibes, right? Like, mm, I'm definitely an ASA, but okay. Um, and just getting them to understand that there's a difference, but the diaspora is still connected, but also what those differences are. And I even think for me, um, simple things like getting them to try certain foods, they're not willing to do those things if they have to put money in those. Um, last year we had a fundraiser where we sold brochettes bouquets for Valentine's Day, but we found that a lot of students here weren't willing to pay for them because it was something that looked foreign to them and that they weren't so sure of versus, you know, had it been something worth more of a giveaway, they might have been more willing to go ahead and try it. Um, and not to just continuously hit the, you know, the nail on the head, but it really comes down to funding. But I also say resources and exposure overall. Um, you know, we're giving specific examples from the headings. I want students to be, oh, I'm so sorry. I want students to be more involved from the front end, you know, with the planning all across the thing. Um, you know, if you need volunteers, then I should know what well, just finished. Let's start today. You know, who are the volunteers? Where are they gonna be? What are their tasks? So that come show day, there are no questions. Everything's already set in stone and it helps make everything run smoother. But even on the other end, we have a lot of fellowships and resources and even with um, alternative spring, you know, spring breaks, Spelman has those, but they're not cheap. As a Spelman student, um, I know me and my lot of friends were like, oh, okay, they're sending students to Ghana for 1500. I don't know, well, you know, you all are adults and have careers, but me as a Spelman student, I don't really have 1500 to just throw around right now, you know. And then it's hard to be able to go and be like, okay, where do I find scholarships to pay this 1500 so that I can get an opportunity to go to Ghana? I haven't been home in Mali in over seven years because going to Africa is not cheap, and I'm aware of that. So just being able to find these fundings, but even then um, on a smaller scale, scale, even if it's not going to the continent, uh, as an ASA, we tried to plan a Streets of Africa Fair last year, which the goal was to showcase um, all African cultures all across the continent and turn Morehouse into an African fair. And we were trying to find, you know, 
Central, South, East, and West African vendors and food places and uh, musicians and artists and people who make clothes to be able to incorporate all of this, but we struggled because we didn't have access to resources and the correct point of contact, but it also goes down to sponsors who were either not willing to just give certain items or whether to give funding to make it a success. So we had very big goals and visions and dreams for this, but we weren't able to truly push it out because of the certain limitations that we had, which then just in the back end, you know, we felt like we weren't able to truly show the students what we wanted to show them from the very beginning, what it was supposed to look like and the way it should have been showcased. So this year we're, we've already started our planning and we're really trying to go in real big to make it something amazing, you know, trying to figure out can we get um, artists to come in, whether the artists are new and up and coming or the artists are already established. Who do we contact to get South African food and not just, no offense, not just Nigerian food, because there's a lot of Nigerians within Atlanta that we can easily contact. You know, making sure that we're showing that there's diversity within the continent and there's a place for everybody. And going back to Brian's point as well, we're not just the safe space for the African students, but being able to open up and making sure that those who are not directly connected with their um, ancestry know that they can come in and learn and adopt another culture if they feel like it resonates with them. Okay, let's, I think we have time for just maybe two questions before we uh, can break. We started a little late, so. Um, I wanted to make sure we got our students represented as well, but. Hello everyone, I'm a student at Carpenter University. My name is Lucia Scholar Rubel. Um, and I wanted to comment and kind of respond on two things that you, you said earlier um, about what are some of the solutions in terms of making sure students can stay engaged with opportunities like these. I had the opportunity uh, to travel to Accra, Ghana last year at Webster University. Um, I got to speak on the panel about Pan Africanism and strategies and things that can be put in place to make sure that we stay connected in terms of African American diasporic institutions and things like that. And one of the main things I said was to make sure that students have access to learn languages, African languages, while they're on campus. Because it's kind of hard to put yourself on this trip and get there and have no idea what's happening around you. Like if you go to Ghana, if you go to South Africa, if you go to Guinea, you don't know any susu, you don't know any, <laughs> you don't know any tree, you don't know anything like that. So I tried to make it a point to talk to people my foreign language department about, hey, can we get these courses and not just only take French and only take Spanish and only take Mandarin? Because we as black students need that connection. It's a great segue to know how to navigate the culture a lot better once you get on the continent. And the second thing I wanted to say was, um, you said something earlier about um, a lot of the Caribbean culture is a lot more like tangible, a lot more palpable for young people. Um, but I will say in Atlanta, Georgia, there's work going on right now. I'm a part of a um, West African Shekere youth ensemble that is learning more and more Yoga culture every day. So work is happening now in terms of children gravitating towards the Shekere, Yoruba folklore, and dancing and singing. So by the time they get to high school and college, they already know like, okay, I've, I've engaged in this before, I've been in this space, and again, learning that culture is a lot more of a segue for them, to, for them to be able to understand what's going on around them. So it's coming, but I just wanted to say that um, work is being done. I work with other students on campus who are pushing for African languages to be at the forefront of language requirements at HBCUs and hopefully institutions in general. I wanted to say something about Oh yeah. So there are a couple of things that I'd like to flag. I've heard the economic piece raised a number of times now. I want money to be the last thing that stands between you and realizing your dreams. There is money out there. There are formal structures at your schools to help you access that money to find out where it is and how you can get your hands on it. But please know from the very outset of your exploration of going abroad that there are there's money set aside by different institutions within government and outside of it to facilitate exactly the kinds of things that you guys are trying to do. So don't go into this, you know, to this adventure with the idea that you might not be able to do it because there's no money for it, because the money is there. You need to first of all engage your um, study abroad office because they have a lot of information. And then here at the Atlanta University Center, there is a diplomat in residence 
from the State Department, whose job it is to help you guys learn about all the different programs that we have, whether it's the Gilman Scholars um, or any number of our fellowships, uh, including Fulbright, uh, that are available to help you see the world and to experience and engage and to have and facilitate that cross-cultural communication. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that you need to continue developing whatever skill sets really ignite your imagination. You don't know where they're going to show up later on in your life. I'll give you a salient example. Secretary Blinken traveled to Africa last March, in March of 2023, and he visited Niger and Ethiopia. Now, for a lot of my life, I oh, <laughs> studied lighting and <laughs> design and color theory because I studied art here at Spelman. And I've always done makeup. In high school, I did makeup. I worked at the makeup counter in college. I did makeup. That's why I made my little money on the side. And I always loved makeup. So fast forward 20 years from me working at Macy's, and Secretary Blinken comes to Ethiopia. And everybody's running around. We all have our own role and what we're going to do to help run this trip smoothly. There's no planning like a level planning that in detail it goes into a State Department, what we call a high level visit, when, a, when a, one of our big wigs comes to the country. There's a lot that goes into it, and people are working for a month ahead of time to make sure that those visits are seamless. So we have all of our assigned roles, and we think everything is buttoned up. And we get in one of our last countdown meetings, and they're like, we don't have a makeup artist. Secretary Blinken has TV to do, and we don't have a makeup artist. And I'm sitting there like, hmm. well, that's curious. Um, and so one of my colleagues is like, well, don't you do makeup? And I'm like, you yeah, but not for the Secretary of State. And she's like, well, she does makeup. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. And so I did his makeup, right. you know? So I would not have really had a chance to have that one-on-one -on -one engagement with him. I'm just one of hundreds of people who works at that embassy. We have a bilateral mission, meaning that we have two embassies in Ethiopia, one that works to the African Union, which is where I work, and then one that works to the um, country of Ethiopia, the bilateral part. So there are probably 800 Americans and Ethiopians working in that facility. I never would have had time for that one-on-one -on -one interaction with our highest executive at the State Department. That is not for the skills that I developed working with Andrea. <laughs> she, she was my little guinea pig at different points in time when we were in college. She was like, I might make it look orange. I'm like, yeah, it does today. <laughs> but all of these little things that you're doing along the way, they matter. The things that you enjoy, they matter. So keep putting your energy and your passion into developing your talents and your skills because you never know which one of those things will serve you along the way. One thing I would say in regards to the lady that made the comment about local languages and possibly teaching them at the universities. That is something that we're working on with HBCUs um, at Beyond the Return. And I know I was alerted by Howard this year that they're actually offering a class for a local Ghanaian language. We're also working with some schools in Louisiana. And then personally, when you move to the countries, it's important for you to try to learn the languages. My son, he was born in Ghana, he's four years old now, and he literally speaks like four languages, but I was very intentional about it. My nanny and everyone else, they can't speak English to him. I only speak English, and he gets English at school, and so now most of the stuff, he speaks Hausa, Tree, Ewe, and another language, so he speaks to me, I don't even know what he's saying. And he'll say, Mommy, then he'll translate for me. He said, I said this. <laughs> but if we speak it to the nanny, he'll switch and he'll speak anyway. So definitely be intentional about it because a lot of African languages are being lost because people were focused on English to get ahead in the world and society. So I know in Ghana and other countries, it's a push to make sure even continental Africans that have moved abroad know the local languages. So it's very, very important. And we also have massive open online courses, um, and you guys should definitely take advantage of that. That allows you to tap into the resources at a lot of the most premier universities around the world and to study what they're studying. You're not going to get a degree from it, but you will have access to the information. So even if your institution doesn't offer it, the information is out there um, if you will avail yourself of it. I'm actually going to build on this point. Um, so I'm Dr. King, I teach sociology at Morehouse, and I helped uh, try to build a ball program at Morehouse 2015 to 2017. Um, I don't know if some of you all will be familiar with Dr. Drew, uh, Dr. 
Julius Coles, who was, he was and he is still a major important contact of the full right, probably made the run to um, with uh, Morehouse and the State Department, um, as well as um, USAMD. Um, he got a grant. He worked with the School for International Training, um, who does uh, the, I know a lot of things right now. He does, the, the School for International Training does foreign language for uh, uh, America, not America, or the one that's abroad, um, right? Three year Peace Corps. Peace Corps, thank you. They do the language training for Peace Corps. So three year contract, we get involved at Morehouse. I, we did a study abroad to introduce students to the Senegalese uh, diaspora community. We took them to Senegal, in Italy, and China in one semester. It was, it was insane. I'll never forget as a faculty person. But um, then, with Wolf as a language at Morehouse, students would take it because, yeah, exactly. We had like three students enrolled in the class the subsequent fall. We had like four students the next semester. Mm -hmm. For the school, right, there has to be an enrollment. Uh, justification to continue paying the teachers, right, to actually teach the course. So for a lot of, you know, we talk to students and of course they're talking about the same thing we're talking about on the continent. I'm, I'm trying to get languages that can tie the money. So I'm taking Chinese, I'm taking, right, Spanish sometimes. Um, it's, it's unfortunately, it has a lot to do with the, the finances behind it. And so what you have to think about is things like they're doing in Ghana where going to start teaching the local languages in the schools, now there's a textbook production industry that has to, right, it has to be institutionalized and tied to the economy uh, for folks here who are so money-minded in age 18 often to process, right? But not always. There's also, there's a big role for entertainers to play. I took Kiswahili, I dropped Spanish to Kiswahili when I was at Howard University as an undergrad, right, because it was about the culture that I grew up in the 90s, or when I was a teenager in the 90s, and hip hop was very Pan-African in the 90s. Made it a natural step for many of us. I was in Swahili class with a solid 15 people, you know, and we had House of Chi. Uh, we had like three Ghanaian ones. We had Chi, Fanti, um, no, and we had three Nigerian languages: Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa, right? And it was, they were all sustained. It's a university, not a college, but still, that was as much a product of popular culture, right? So the, the, that's the other thing I was gonna say earlier, is that, right, helping young people understand that there's the music of today, when you think about the headies, when you think about, right, um, Afro, Afro beats, but my wife is a Ghanaian, and she does not listen to anything from today. Why? Because, in her words, they're not talking about them. <laughs> but when, as soon as we got married, right, she introduced me to the music from the 80s that she grew up with, where it was actually, uh, cultural critique, it's engaging with issues that tie it back and help you understand history. She introduces me to Nollywood and Gollywood, but it's the films from the 80s and 90s that were political, right? And then you learn about culture from just watching because you have to ask these questions. So I'll end there, but I think um, the broader artistic piece that brings this full circle is extremely important to everything we're trying to do. The beauty is this is a networking reception. So please um, just enjoy, take this time. I think we heard from one of our panelists that you should speak. You never know who's in the room and to get to know one another. We're really pleased that you all are here. You had one question? Yeah, I was just okay. okay, one last one. Hold on, let me give you the mic. Hello, um, my name is Victoria Smith. I actually have the University and I'm actually a little bit looking for my class, but this was really engaging, so I was like, how am I supposed to stay? Um, I actually went to Ghana this past summer in uh, May. Uh, we actually got connected with the uh, Ghana Board of Authority, and it was an amazing experience. Um, we spent like two and a half weeks there. Um, went to, we started in Prague, went to Kumasi, went to Cape Coast. Um, we just, there was a whole lot thrown at us, and um, the, like, I would say that the classroom itself that was studying the creative, creative economy of Ghana, and I would say one of the things that I was able to take away from it is, like, I'm Jamaican, right? And I didn't understand how much, like, the uh, Asante tribe 
was so engulfed in like Jamaican culture. Like they fly like Jamaican flag, like everywhere I've gone, like it's like this. And like coming back to the States, I want to say that like being at TSU and then coming to uh, come to you guys' campus, I think what would help to like bring more awareness is that like connecting with us because Georgia State, you know, we got a whole lot, but we have resources and like being able to combine budgets and being able to put together bigger shows, bigger resources because celebrities love coming to y'all school, but we are able to actually have like big facilities to facilitate that as well. Um, I am a senior this year, so I'm not involved in as much because I got full life life and career. But um, we have like our own like Caribbean cultures, we have our own like our Caribbean like uh, clubs and like you know African clubs and everything else of the sort. Um, I think we saw like past like coming back from the pandemic when we combined like homecomings over at ours how like big was able to get. So it was like doing more of that we'll be able to see more engagement as well. So you know I know schools can be a little you know stingy sometimes but it's about kind of going out there and finding it because like the 1500 for Spelman is crazy but our trip to Ghana was like together for the course was like six thousand dollars and I had to go with uh, Gilbin and you know they helped and so much from my financial aid and everything else of sort but it helped to see that the money is out there you just have to be you have to just go on the street to get it and you have other people that's boost to like also help out as well. Make for youth, 
you know, more aware of Africa. The first thing that came to my mind was reading. Read novels from Africa. And you have an idea. Forget about the stories you are told by our instructors. Experience as Africa for yourself. And you can do it by reading classic novels, plays from Africa to get used to the culture of the people. Watch television, watch Nollywood, all right? Even uh, the YouTube is there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach them some cultural dances. And we have just finished the gym on Friday. We completed the audition in for the play I want to direct, based in Nigeria, The Missing Face by Tess on Women. Or when I get back, we will start our rehearsals. What my mission is, is anything I do is to bring out the African culture embedded in the play. That's why I have to teach them the play, so that all the cultural elements in the play will be made to pay to them. And the dancing they are going to do, I'll give them the story, the history behind each of those dances, so that they will understand what the dances were used for, you know, in originally before they became uh, all right for entertainment and all that and all that. Somebody said something. Uh, the ladies man said something about, you know, people. Africa is a, it's, it's, it's a, how life, it's a virgin land that needs to be brought. So much is in Africa that the world does not know about yet. And that is because somebody just said that we do these things, you know, and, you know, forget about it. We do not push like want to show people, but the awareness is coming. You see, Africa is so blended. But the fact is that there's something cultural about, you know, not um, what would I call it? There's something sure you can say sometimes uh, that a tiger does not go about shouting his tiger to that when he leaves, <laughs> you know that is a tiger. And there is something cultural about that idea. In our place, in Nigeria, we are so talented, and we believe that this is a gift from God. All right? We do not go to make money with these kids. It's endemic. It's, it's, deep in the cultural beliefs. The first thing is to show that talent. People can give you money, trust money. If you're a dancer, you're dancing, and people, you know, they will win as much as they are moved. They will give you money, you just throw money, and you just follow it and move your way. But for somebody to go and begin to make, like, you know, uh, the this man that said, I thought, sorry. <laughs> I uh, you know, that, you know, said that uh, there is a, I like you not to be said, you show me the work you do, not your talent, because you know, this is what I do, this is talent, all right? So, we did not go to use these natural talents that God has given you to make money, you have to go and do some farm work, that is work. A man is what he can produce with this. Okay, so we are now, you know, keen into using whatever we have, whatever talent we have, to get money. So we are just coming out of it. That's why I say, you think that Africa has a lot of talent? That is an understatement. What remains is to penetrate Africa, and then you see how right you are. So, thank you so much for listening to me because uh, I was giving this deal. I said I had a lot of things to say, but uh, I just have to end it. Uh, mm -hmm. I have one project that I do not know. Maybe I will involve a lot of you here. I don't know. You, Neron.
you know, because I don't think that maybe my next semester I'll be able to mount the animal that will involve uh, the every races of the world, the session of every races of the world, and so on. So I don't know how I'm going to do that, but if I'm able to, you know, bring in some of you talents, maybe that will happen. Thank you so much for this. We're just going to wrap up because we are a little uh, behind time, but we just want to thank all the panelists, our awesome moderator. Um, I do want to take just a quick moment to recognize our AUC Woodruff Library staff who has been um, very involved from engaging in scholarship and our planning and assessment and communication staff as well. So um, Dr. Aaron carter Henny, thank you again. For Our panelists, and I'm going to ask the students, all students in here, no matter where you're, what school you represent, please um, come forward. We'd like to take a few pictures with you all um, to capture this. And uh, everyone else, feel free to eat, and we'll um, have a reception for a little bit. You don't have to run out. Thank you. <laughs>